My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Red Wine. Um, We are so happy to have you join us on Veterans Day. Um, So I want to give a huge shout out to all of our military veterans that are listening. We thank you so much for your service. Um, It is greatly appreciated, and we respect everything that you've done for our country. Um, Normally, you'd be hearing Jody doing the intro, but Jody is having an issue with her internet right now in Colorado, so you guys are all going to be stuck with myself, but luckily, we have Lou, who's going to be joining me, um, and the- we're going to be um, talking about quite a few things tonight, but more importantly, we're so happy to have Justin Durham, who will be joining us shortly. Um, he is an Army veteran. And he overcame uh, veteran suicide, which we all know is a very serious subject that um, I think, especially on Veterans Day, that that we need to address. 
Um, he's going to be talking about his memoir that he wrote, 81 Days and the Hidden Suicide, which is available on Amazon if anyone would like to read it. Um, it was um, very emotional to read. Um, I recognized a lot in Justin um, as growing up as uh, a child of a mother who suffered from bipolar. Um, and I think he'll be telling you uh, his story and, and what he struggled with um, when he was serving in the Army uh, as a behavioral um, technician. So I'm going to let him tell that story when he comes on. But it's, it's very um, heartwarming, bittersweet. Um, and I think he's going to really be able to help a lot of people that are struggling, um, as they come out of the armed forces and back from overseas. Um, so other than that, I didn't get a chance to be on the air last week to talk about the election, which we all know is still not settled. And we're very happy to say that they will be doing the hand recount in Georgia, which I'm very, very interested to find out what the results will actually be of the hand count. And um, what have you heard, Lou, being from the lovely state of Georgia? Um, well, as far as I can tell, they're not rioting in Atlanta tonight, but I fully expect them to at some point about this recount because I'm sure they're not happy about it. Um, what, what do you think the recount could potentially show? Well, I think that I'd whatever the accurate count was. I mean, my, my, at, at the gut level, just knowing how people around here feel, it will be how exactly how we expected it to be, which is closer in the Atlanta counties. Um, some of them will flip. If what we're hearing is correct about the, how wrong the numbers are, Cobb County might flip, which would be kind of huge because, you know, <laughs> Democrats have been claiming that one for a while. So, you know, but I, I mean, I don't really know. It, it's, it's really kind of hard to tell. I just, I just want the truth. I want the right friggin' numbers. I want numbers that aren't manipulated digitally or, you know, through <clears throat> rogue counter, um, uh, election, nefarious means. election re officials, rogue election officials. They, right. they did. You know, we've had an unconstitutional rule change in our state as well. So, I mean, you know, there's that. There's just, it's just too much. There's just way too much shit going on. And, and I I have remembered hearing, not just in, in uh, Georgia, but in, in the other states, is what was not taken into account is actually the, the amount of Democrats that voted for Trump, that that's what they're not talking about, but it just seems there's a lot of anomalies. Um, yeah. Frank well, Luntz, for example, uh, puts out there about the same day voters um, and same day registered voters, or new registrations in Wisconsin, and he's trying to, to do all these calculations, and I'm like, don't bother with the calculations, because number one, if you have a new voter that's already been registered in the state of Wisconsin, okay, and they vote in another district, that's a wash because they're going to come off the rolls from where they were and they're going to come on to the new rolls. You need to concentrate on all the new voters that moved into the state. You have your 18-year-olds that will be registering for the first time, and you have voters that may have been in the state but had never registered to vote before. Those are your actual same-day registered voters. And what that is, is they have to sign a document. That document then gets scanned into um, the, uh, we call it in New Hampshire here, the, the checklist, the voter checklist, or the, the supervisors of the checklist are the ones that are responsible for all, inputting all the information, scanning it in so they have the signature to match it to. That's how it works in the state of New Hampshire, because we do same-day registration. So for, for the... You know, information, and if you hear a noise, it's because my cat is literally about to fall off of, on top of all these cushions. And Okay, well, she just fell. So anyways, I digress. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, but, but that's how same-day registration works. And as I've put out there, we had three windows open, and we had about 349 same-day voter registrations from people that moved from other districts, new voters, whatnot. That's three windows from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The, the amount of new voters, if you go 
by Wisconsin numbers is close to, I want to say, I think it could be a half a million to 900,000 is what they're saying. Wait. That so is. Same that's, day registrations? Same day registration. No, they didn't. Yes, that's impossible. No, so, but the way that yours goes in is they have to scan an actual document and then it gets added. They, they, what happens is they, when they same day register or whatever, they get a document that's, that they sign that, and they have to have, provide proof of residence of a domicile along with a driver's license. Then they are given the document. They go in, they give their name to, um, one of the registers of the checklist, they're given a ballot. They fill out their ballot. As they're exiting, before they put their ballot into the scanner, this is how it is in New Hampshire, they have to hand the document that they signed to the exit checklist registers. Then that documentation goes to the supervisor who takes it and scans it into um, a, a particular checklist software that the state of New Hampshire uses. That's where you have your documentation that shows uh, where your address was. Um, because a person can come in and say, oh, I moved to Barnstead three weeks ago. And, and they can say, where were you registered before? We registered in New Hampshire. Yes, I was registered in, I'm going to throw out a town, hooks it. They're able to actually physically go right onto the computer and pull up the registration and that documentation where they went and registered and hooks it, and they'll be able to match the signature with their driver's license or whatnot. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and why they can't do that in other states, it's about a 15, 20-minute process to actually do the same-day registration or, or when you're moving. Most people like to do it beforehand, but, you know, a lot yeah, of people and I don't came out and voted so to register. By the way, my town went... Two to one for Trump. Anyways, yeah. I, I don't have a problem with same day registrations if they're done like that. Okay. But what what I'm seeing in the affidavits, because I'm that geek that has read the affidavits or is reading the affidavits, I think they're up to like 80 something or 90 something. I mean, it's unbelievable the number of affidavits that they have um, alleging fraud of some kind or yes. another, but from reading them, there's all number of things that they're, they're doing. And even if you have a tight process, there's still an open windows where, you know, someone can potentially take a ballot and then add it to the new registrations or just assign it to, um, a, and it's not a sign like the ballot and, and your personal information isn't necessarily connected. I can't tell you that it's not, but I'm not saying that it is. Um, but you have to account for a voter. So for every ballot, you have to account for a voter and say this voter voted, right? Yep. To, in order to get the ballot through, they just pick a random registered voter. So that's one of the things that they were doing in Michigan, allegedly. Mm. So... There's, there's so many steps in the process that are meant to create security that in some instances, depending on how they're handled, create insecurity. And in some instances, many instances, it looks like insecurity by design. So anyway, it's, it, there's so much shit going on. It's crazy. It's fun. Yeah. It's in a, in a way it's fun for a geek like me to get into it, but you know, in other ways, I'm getting infuriated. Yeah, it's yeah, it's even more infuriating. Some sometimes when you understand something, it just makes it more frustrating. Exactly. Yeah, like now, I think we're going to be bringing Justin in in just uh, maybe right now, right? Well, we're calling. <laughs> I'm calling him right now, Hello? and I think he answered. Hi, you're on the air, Justin. Oh, I feel. Hi, like Justin. How good. are you? Pretty good. How are you? Thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. Um, again, this is, <laughs> how are you doing tonight? I'm Diane. Uh, pretty good. Thanks for asking. Hey, Diane. Hi. Um, so anyways, again, joining us is Justin Durham, and um, you wrote your memoir, 81 Days, The Hidden, Su Hidden Suicide. Um, and I have to tell you, first off, I'm going to say the name Andrew Davis because that struck me what you wrote about Andrew. So we want to recognize Andrew. And if you could tell people a little bit about Andrew, 
and then um, talk about your book. That would be fantastic because I know Andrew obviously was something very important to you. Well, actually, I just, I've known Andrew since like the third grade. And I came, well, I graduated college in 2010 from UCF and I was kind of depressed. I didn't know, I was kind of tra- was trying to make the, uh, what do you call it, the shift between being in college and being an adult. And Andrew helped me get to a phase of life that's pretty d- tough for most people. Right. And he wound up committing suicide. You know, he served the Marines. So I and did everything he could for our country and he wound up killing himself. But I wrote the book in six days, actually. I was actually in Honolulu, Hawaii when I did Waikiki. Now, are you still in, in Hawaii or are you back um, in Florida? No, I'm Florida? home now. Yeah, I'm so, home now. Okay. Could you, could you talk a little bit about why the book was important to you and... and, and um, you know, talk a little bit about um, what precipitated you writing this book. Well, uh, veteran suicide is a topic that is often overlooked, and I worked as a behavioral health specialist or six eight x ray x ray. That was my military operational specialty at Tripler Army Medical Center for what four years in Honolulu. And you know, I didn't know it was that many people in the military that want to commit suicide, and I found out that quite there's a whole bunch of people that actually do it and about I believe the government uh, Office of Accountability did a uh, study not too long ago and I think it was about uh, it averages averages out of about 70 every 72 minutes a day a veteran commits suicide so I felt it was a topic someone needed to speak on because not too many people would discuss it or even want to approach it and then you got a lot of uh, veterans that actually drive to the VA, you know, a lot of people uh, make mentions of how bad the VA is. I actually don't even care about my VA benefits because I don't like the VA just because how the customer service, the treatment, the whole process is very uh, rudimentary and old. So I don't really like it. But actually, it's a lot of uh, soldiers who have actually drove to the VA with their medical records and actually set themselves on fire to protect oh. uh, the treatment of veterans. So that's kind of why, like watching all of that made me want to write the book. To speak out for those that, that could no longer speak out. Everybody, including me. Can't forget about me. Oh, I know. I, I, I was reading that and, and I recognized, um, you know, I'm not sure if, if you had heard, but my, my mother suffers from bipolar and was, mm-hmm. you know, in and out of hospitals um, probably up until I was about, I'm going to say 14, um, until she actually found a doctor that um, found the, the perfect dose, I guess, if you will, of medication that, you know, kept her stable. Um, and she's been, you know, stable ever since. And, and reading a story, I, I recognized. Um, and you know, when you, you listed the medications that you took, what they had you on, it was astounding. Um, and I don't know if you could, if you wanted to talk about what medications that the, um, your doctor had you on to, I guess they wanted you to be stable. Did you consider yourself stable taking all of those? I was confused. I wasn't sure about taking what I was taking, but they, uh, prescribed me, I believe it was probably seven different medications at once. I was uh, supposed supposed to take nine pills a day at one point. Wow. The list included uh, two narcotics, uh, sleeping medication, and a whole bunch of stuff for hyperthyroid, hyperthyroidism and my blood pressure. So it was a heck of a cocktail, I guess. Yeah, so I... Um, Justin, this is this is Lou. You can tell Diane I apart really easily because she's a northerner and I'm the southerner. Mm-hmm. We don't we don't sound anything alike at all. So um, I've known veterans that were in that situation, and it was really difficult. There's a point where I think probably everybody I knew at some point was able to get off or, or just wanted to get off and got off those me- medications, but it was really hard. Like they had really hard times doing that. I did you was there a point where you know you tried to stop taking some of it and? 
Well, you actually get in trouble, though. Actually, it's a requirement of your treatment once you're documented in your medical records, you can actually be, uh, what is it called, punitively punished for not taking your medication. So right. it's, it's a hard process to get on by default. Right. So you have to like get permission permission from your doctor. Well, and the other thing that I wanted to ask you was um, the you worked as basically as a mental health um, counselor in a military facility uh, with um, it sound you know it sounds like some um, that it was kind of trying and. Intense. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That I didn't want to put words in your mouth, but it, I mean, it, it sounds like that was a really difficult, difficult situation. That that seems like it would be really hard. Well, it depends, I guess. You know, if you buy into the military system or the standard treatment of soldiers, and you're not really clued in, or you're not informed, or you don't read much, but when you rec- when you sit back and recognize. That uh, the standardization of mental health treat- treat- treatment shouldn't be allowed. You know, people should be allowed to be individuals and they shouldn't be punished for not necessarily not buying into the military way of thought, but just, just being an individual. Because right. I believe that is what causes a lot of the trauma and uh, yes. suicide and the crisis of the Because people forget that there are actually people and there's people outside the military that love them too. Right, so yeah. They're not so- allowed to see a lot of people still, so. Yeah. Do that, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like they that some people are really kind of over prescribed in the military. You found? Did you? You it sounds like you found. They that call thing. it. You can, you can say it, they say we uh, we call it pill to death. Pill to death. Yeah, yeah. I, I think pill I pill to death. Yeah, and that's. Um, do you feel like they're they're working toward reform in that area? Has there been any improvement? I put it like this. I'm glad I'm out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's not that's not that's not something I can say. I'll well, just say I'm glad I'm out. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. Um, and I don't know. It sounds like something that it would be good for everyone to advocate for. I guess is kind of the point that mm-hmm. that that I wanted to get to is is to realize that people should should know and realize that that's kind of being done to service members and to some extent, I think veterans as well. So, yeah. And I think, yeah, just, um, because, just, I was going to say, just because you serve doesn't mean the world's in it to you. It's not that easy. Yeah. I right. think the commercials confu- confuse people when they're trying to get people to enlist them and, or during recruitment. But once you get in, you see the paperwork and see what you got to do. And then you start doing what they want you to do. And you understand that, Hey, what about me? It's kind of, it's a difficult process, and I think a lot of people get lost in that transition, and especially when we uh, attempt to transition back to society after we are no longer enlisted. It's very really difficult to a lot of people get lost. That's why we uh, we got a lot of veterans lost. So that means you're, you're a bad person. You know, you just got lost in that whole transition. So do you think people? Do you think veterans would benefit more from having, uh, say, like a transition team or um, target group that helps a veteran along the way so that he doesn't get lost in the system and is not one that shows up at the VA because they need help and you know no one's reaching out to them. I mean, there, there's. I know they have some of those, but are they effective? It's sure, sure is good. It's just like if, when you're growing up, it's good to have a parent. So it would be good to have a sponsor for any any type of period between three to six months. You know, even after eighteen months. You know, you just have to make people aware. And, and I'm sure a lot of people signed up. Why not? You mentioned in your book that you guys are were signed a battle buddy. Um, is that something that you think could potentially benefit? Um, you know. You're you're already transitioned to civilian life, so you would could be like a civilian buddy, I guess. Without, I don't know if that's what you call him. Mean, that's probably simple. But, well, um, I wouldn't be as cold. I wouldn't be as cold as my battle buddy was when I first showed up in Hawaii after after uh, AIT. 
because you know they kind of been through the been through the whole ringer or whatnot, so they might have a jaded personality. But now you know, once you go through it, you don't want anybody to suffer. So when you're out, you know, if you can help somebody, typically that's what you want to do, especially somebody coming from your type of background situation. You know, you, right? Because you you yeah, worked yeah. with you worked with the most critical of the inpatient. Um, you know the people that were wanted to commit suicide from all over the the you know armed forces and and that will come to Hawaii to the hospitals even and I know you mentioned in your book also High priority. residents High yeah. priority to the lowest. and and you know dealing with that because your story I think was based a lot on the gentleman that you helped over the course of the eighty one days. Well, because he was the gentleman that that had tried to commit suicide three times before he got put into the program that you were running, correct? Well, he got so put you, in twice, and the last time they just, you know, he had to stay. Right, and he, you know, and and I know I mentioned because a lot of times leadership will be like, you know, we will get penalized if something happens, so do what you got to do, and I think. You know, it fell upon you day in and day out to, you know, help him as much as you can. And you were probably the the person that got him to, as you put it, click that he wanted to live. And I think you said you, he probably is still alive. But in all that... Well, of course, I know he's still alive. Yeah. But in all that, I think, from, from reading your words, you got lost. You were lost along the way. And, and I wouldn't say I was lost. I just didn't, I just didn't know the word was... So uh, uh, jaded, I guess. So I, maybe I was naive to the fact that you know some people just really don't care whether you live or die. But once I discovered that it's not a phenomenon, but like occurrence in life, or when it uh, comes to having rapport with, rapport with individuals that aren't necessarily your family, or whether they're family or not, I didn't know people are that cold. So, I, so you felt alone. I just didn't care. I just didn't care. I was alone. I just didn't care. And what what do you think it was that made you start to care again? Mm, I don't know. I just like to have fun. So <laughs> I wanted to have fun again. So if you look at the pictures in the book, I'm like, well... What about me is gone that used to be in some of those photos having fun? And, you know, it might, I might not never be doing or attempting some of the same uh, thrill-seeking activities that I used to do, but just to, to, at the base point, like, why don't I be alive? Why, why do I not want to be alive? So I'm like, I don't necessarily want to die, right? Because if you die, you can't really come back and not do anything. No, so, and... and- you know, and, and you think about um, the people that you leave behind that, you know, um, that will obviously miss you greatly, which at the point in time, you're probably not thinking about anyhow. But And I'm very glad that you made the no, decision to, to move on and, and, and take your your experience and, and help help many others that read your book and recognize what you're saying in them. Mm-hmm. Am know? I allowed to uh, you curse on this show or not? <laughs> oh, hell yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. We, uh, yeah trust oh, okay. me, drop the F bomb. Well, a lot of people, the short story I always tell when people ask, you know, why would you want to kill yourself or why did you attempt? And, you know, as much of a journey I've, as I've had and much of uh as problematic as my life has been at times, I always tell people, you know, I just had to uh, attempt to, uh, to kill myself just so I can ask the devil why he is like a bitch. But anyway, <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I been through so much hell. Yeah, well, that's a good, that's well, a good I, answer. Yeah, you let me go. <laughs> yeah. He did. <laughs> you and you walked out going, "Yeah, bitch, I won." <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to dance no more. So my life's been pretty okay ever since. I'm not gonna say I'm the richest, or the most fancy, or the prettiest guy. Yeah, I don't have the most fun, but you know I'm okay. <laughs> you, you know, but most importantly, you, the the reason that you're here is is 
you know, the man above had a, a, a much bigger plan for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and Brand, I think... Spring is important. You gotta, it's important for people, whether they're religious or not, to have something to look forward to. Uh, as far as the afterlife is concerned, you don't want to just think that hitting a uh, wooden box or being cremated is just the end. It's good to have something to look forward to at all times. Oh, oh, you know, I, 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 you know, I try not to think about, you know, at the point in time where I'll eventually leave this earth because I'm claustrophobic, Nobody so I can't go on the morbid. ground. Nobody wants to be more. Yeah. No, but I, but I, I had to stop doing my will because honestly, I'm claustrophobic, so I can't be buried, and then I also don't like fire, so I can't be cremated. So, you mm-hmm. know, trying to figure out where. <laughs> I'm just going to live forever, I've decided. <laughs> I know. Hopefully, <laughs> eternally. <laughs> exactly. But if you love God, you know, if you're a Christian, that's typically what happens. Right. Yeah. And and I think, um, you know, you're, what do you see in, in the future for yourself as far as, um, you know, writing or, um, you know, maybe talking? Do you, do you, do you actually, like, do like seminars for people to listen to, um, YouTube, just to, to, so that people can find you and, 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 you know, relate to you, talk to you because well, sometimes, I've spoken to, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go right ahead. Uh, actually, I just got my book put in, uh, on uh, actually a paperback this year. So a lot of people didn't think my book was worthwhile reading, but it was just an ebook. So I'm still in the uh, initial stages of, you know, growing the popularity with my books. I'm still working on my uh, first book, but my I try to write about 100 words a day. And, you know, whether it's uh, just, uh, what are you saying, digressing from whatever bad decision or good decision I might might, might, might make that might not uh, necessarily be the best decision for me. But I try to drop at least 100 words a day. So I got about close to 19,000 words towards my second book. And the question is if I even really want a second book. It's not that big of a deal to me. Because I really accomplished what I want to accomplish because I was able to write a book in six days. I didn't write it to impress anybody and I didn't write it to get rich and I wrote it to actually help someone else. So I'm not a selfish, conceited person. So I wrote it for a good cause. Oh, you absolutely did, and and so the answer. I, I really don't have anything to prove. That's my thing. I'm just chilling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I that. Uh, I've done it. You know, I lived in Hawaii twice. A little. I've done a lot of things. A whole bunch of stuff. So I'm just chilling. That's awesome. Yeah. That's it, awesome. It, it is. Have... And, and if anyone again out there is is um, looking for your book, it is available um, on Amazon. Um, and paperbacks, where would the paperbacks be located? Uh, you just, it's on Amazon Canada. You just have to click the, it's two formats of the book. One is the ebook. It's actually a drop down menu. It says format. And then you click on it and it says you get the ebook. And I tried to make, I can't make the ebook free anymore. I guess the popularity won't allow me, but, uh, it's as cheap as I can make it, which is one ninety nine. The only reason the ebook is priced where it is is so the workers to actually make the book and send it out and get paid. That's I awesome. It. Even so, I dropped my royalties, royalties that I received for every book I said, uh, sell down. So, that's not and because, you said you know, that you're, the, typically, you're, you're, you're typically not supposed to really profit off of subject like this in that manner. You know, you know, if people pay me to speak and stuff like that, I can't help that, you know, because, you know, nothing in life is free, but just to set out for the purpose of getting rich, on a subject like this isn't necessarily, you know, I mean, it's frowned upon, at least in my, uh, it's not your goal. Uh, your goal, is, yeah, your goal yeah. is to help, help others mm-hmm. that have, and the, t- um, the title is 81 days. 81 days in suicide. Yeah. And it's, um, available at, uh, Amazon. And what we're going to do too, is we'll put the link on the red wine, um, so if anybody is would like to order, you'll be able to just click right on the link and go right to it. Um, yeah, Amazon made it pretty easy. Like I still published, like I wrote it in six. I had it published on the internet, and three days later, so about nine days, I was published. 
Right, and I think you said that you you um, your the charity that you worked with or that's most important to you is Code Code of Fats. Right. It's Raymond Gracious Smith. He raised what two million dollars in about two years, and he does a really good job. So, I'm, and that you I, I know, because we need to we need to take care of our our vets and and you know you to this day. Sure. Right. I mean, to this day, when I when I I'd still get really, um, you know, upset when I think about how our our vets from Vietnam were treated. Um, it, it's improved, obviously, since then. But um, you know, it's just it's really important that we we you know make sure that they get everybody gets the help that they need, um, and that they don't fall through the cracks, and that. You know, having to rely on the VA, I mean, we, we did, back in the early days of our show, um, was when the events were going on at the VA, like in Arizona, and we did a few shows on that, and, and you know, well, one of, did. yeah, well, we, we would be so frustrated when they're putting, you know, tens of millions of dollars into these big showy buildings, really? um, with Not overruns, right, and... You know, we have we have veterans that were like, you know, begging for help. Please help me. And it's like you they don't have want one person working like a right. million cases. That's the stupidest shit I ever seen in my life. But anyway, that's the story. I I don't even I won't even go to the VA. I don't like the VA at all. Yeah, and, and I think the I fact that they that gave I don't care veterans the choice to go where they wanted to to go. Um, you know, that was a, a big deal. I think for a lot of veterans. Because you, you have that choice, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to go to the VA. And my other thing is a lot of people like to, to try to base the treatment of veterans on the uh, best choice type. But my thing is if they com didn't commit high treason, which is really going against the orders of the president, not necessarily your command, it doesn't matter what they did. I think everybody should get treated the same because at the day we in signed up, we were thinking about anything. We were thinking about hopefully bettering ourselves and in the meantime, or at the same time, better in our country, not necessarily taking advantage of people individually. So, for people to minimize or to take away people's service, or or the the magnitude of the service of someone that decided to join whatever branch it was, just because of a discharge type, is still ridiculous to me. But anyway, that's just my thought on that too. Because there's there's different reasons why someone may have been um, discharged if if you know. Depending they on should be heard. They should right. be heard. Everybody should be given the same fair chance to have to like equal treatment to understand, you know, like maybe like I said, there are mitigating circumstances in every case. I'm not saying, you know, there aren't people that you probably shouldn't give benefits to just you know, just because of some of the decisions they made. However, you know, you can't really just say that automatically though. You gotta give everybody a fair chance. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I do thank you so much for um, coming on. And again, we're going to put the link for um, your book on our website at the. Um, we'll put it on at the our Twitter at the Red Wine. Um, and mm -hmm. we thank you so so much for coming on. And I am very glad that you, um, you know, made the decision that you were going to continue on because you are helping a lot of people. Um, it's plain talk in your book. Um, and it, it's a It's very just a long poem. People don't understand it. They say, I don't understand your book. It's just a long poem. It's a prose poem. You know, some of it is written in standard, uh, uh, what do you call it? Standard, standard grammar, grammar. Yes. Whatever, but most of it's poetry. So I don't understand what's difficult about that. We all went to school, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. <laughs> I read it and I was, I, I, you know, totally knew where you were going on everything and and um it, it's really it's and, and you know what it's you're not only helping veterans but i think you know anyone that has had family members um with mental health issues they can read this book and understand you know what you went through and the, and the feelings that you had um and you know and that that's just even you know more of a bonus um as far as helping people so um, and yeah. I, and Which again, these are the answers for everything. Neither, neither is narcotic. So, 
you know, you can do anything as long as you do it in moderation and have control, but, you know, that's typically what we all lean to. I had my experience with that whole thing. And, you know, people frown upon that too, but you got to understand why people will even, or veterans will even make that decision or why would they lean to, even on active duty, like what's going on. And it's deep, it's profound, the, the entire experience. It isn't just black and white, like, you know, when you sign all the contracts we sign or every day we go to work, just having a DOD number, you know, you're still dealing with people. Oh, absolutely. So I'm not going to hold you guys up. I don't know how much time you had a lot of for me to speak, but, you know, I really appreciate it. I don't want you guys to not know that. I just want to let you guys know. Oh, no, we, I thank greatly you. appreciate you coming on. And again, thank you very much for all that you've done um, for your service. And, um, you know, if someone's listening tonight that, you know, they aren't quite sure what they're feeling, um, you know, do know that there is help out there. Um, whether reaching out to you, which they can reach out to you on Twitter. Could you let us know where he, they can reach you on Twitter? I try to respond to everybody that contacts me individually all the time. And what's so your handle? Really bad time. I might be asleep sometimes if I don't respond sometimes. What's, what's your Twitter? I try um, to respond. Uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter at, a, at JD underscore future bread. And well, and you know, we have your link on the red wine as well. And and it's you know, um, anyone out there, reach out to Justin. Um, he, as he said, might be sleeping, um, but he will always <laughs> answer back. To, <laughs> he'll answer back to you. Do not fear. Um, and and you know, you can make a new friend tonight because I think I made a new friend tonight too. <laughs> All righty, ladies. It was good to meet both of you. Thank you so much, and we'll be in. Well, we'll still stay in touch because we'll just. We always like to touch base and make sure anybody that's been on our show how they're doing and checking in with them. And um, you know, yeah. So thank you so much, and we greatly appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Justin. It was our thank honor you. to have you on, and thank you for your service. Yeah. All righty. Happy Veterans Day. Bye bye. You as well. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Yeah. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hi, I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's largest mortgage lender. Spring will be here soon, so if buying a new home is on your to-do list, right now is the time to call Quicken Loans. Learn about which mortgage options make sense for you and get a jump on your competition. With our exclusive Rate Shield approval, the low rate you lock today is protected for up to 90 days while you shop for your new home. With a Rate Shield approval, if rates go up, your low rate stays locked. But if rates go down, you get that new, even lower rate. Either way, you win. Talk to us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com to take advantage. Here's another great reason to work with us. For a record nine years in a row, J.D. Power has ranked Quicken Loans highest in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. Again, to lock in today's low mortgage interest rate and get the security of our exclusive rate shield approval, call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. For J.D. Power award information, visit jdpower.com. Rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Sesame Ginger Glaze Chicken Signature Wrap. How would you like it? I'll take a... Sports announcer at home? Yeah, how'd you... We just know. My wife picks up the new signature wrap. It's got double the rotisserie-style chicken mixed with a sesame ginger glaze. She appears annoyed at me, but she shrugs it off. Those sweet and savory flavors are calling her name. She lifts the wrap and... She takes the bite! Incredible! And now she's closing the door on my... Subway, make it what you want. Limited time only at participating restaurants. Double meat based on average six-inch sub. I'm Little Teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spell. No, that like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and pour me out. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. 
KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. And we have returned. I just know you missed us because I missed us too. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to do a quick why I hate Joe Biden segment because no, <laughs> what is the red wine the show unless we have our Joe why I hate Porsche Joe Biden. Show. So I hate Joe Biden because he is not my president. And now I am part of the resist. Resistance. How do you like that? Resist. Democrat? Resist. Resist this because it's 2020 and anything can happen. And what I want to happen is I want to see Joe Biden forget that he ever was potentially presidential elect. <laughs> Well, I mean, if, if, if he doesn't, if he doesn't end up getting inaugurated, it won't take him very long to forget. I don't think. Because <laughs> yeah, it'll be Kamala. Yeah. Kamala what's, heals but, up Paris. That'll be the. <laughs> what's the what what happens with that anyways, by the way? What if he sits there and, you know, doesn't quite make it to inauguration day? How does that work? Well, I, I was really thought about talking. That. I was talking more about the recounts than I was his health. <laughs> well, you're right, and I, honestly, the recounts I truly think are going to shift um, because you, you know we were talking briefly before Justin came on, and thank you again so much, Justin, for coming on our show. Um, but I remember seeing a video where someone had put up. You know, while the counts were on the bottom, all of a sudden this like yellow blurb showed up in the upper right hand corner. Did you see that one? Um, the Pornhub one? No. No, what this was is it was there was a, a yellow box and it showed the numbers um in in the um election. It showed Trump and it showed Biden and it was the numbers reversed from what was it was actually the numbers were being subtracted. You could see it live subtracting. Yeah, I, I've seen the ones where the numbers go backwards live. Um, that actual that is actually in the data set that was pulled off the New York Times. So someone with a, a, a Python debugger um, <laughs> that knows Python wrote a script that scraped all of the um, updates that happened with the time and, and all of that from the New York Times. So there's a there's a data set that's a record of who had what at what time, right? So what time of the evening. And there are, there are many, like almost every state has one, um, groups of data where the numbers will flip so, it, well, what this was is it was um, it was the it, reporter talking, and you could see the yeah you, you know, can how they see usually it. have it on the bottom. But he free he like freeze framed it backwards in like slow motion, and all of a sudden you saw this box come up, and it was it was I guess because it's their systems like update like the numbers will update like say let's say every ten minutes or something like that, yeah. and he happened to catch. When it was actually updating, because wasn't it updating live while they were all on the air? Yeah, they they were. They were updating live. But yeah, you can actually, so yeah. this box came up split second, not even split second, and you could see the numbers on there. Uh, yeah, which, I saw quite a few of those it's from different states. But, but yeah, what I'm saying is, if you weird. look at that, if you look at that data, that same data, those updates that came out on paper, it's almost every state has one. So there's several videos out there that catch one state or another, but it's not just a few states. It's almost every state, and you can see it. Because 47 states use Dominion, correct? Well, it's not just... Here's the other thing. Dominion isn't the only... Okay, so that... 
moving votes from one candidate to another is done through a weighted race algorithm, right? Okay. So it's, yep. it's just a program that runs with the existing data and moves things around. So, um, it, like it, so what it does is it'll say, well, we're going to count 40% of Trump's votes and we're going to count 160% or yeah, 160% of or 140 percent of biden's votes so that's it's like let's see it's like having two kids and rewarding them but one kid is bigger so you give them a large snicker and the other kid is smaller so you give them a mini snicker right so it's like for every one vote joe biden you're going to get 1.4 votes and for every one vote uh, Trump, you're going to get 0.6 votes. You see what I mean? Yes. Okay. So the algorithm is actually a feature of the software. And this has been known for, for two years or for 10 years or more that these voting machines, not just Dominion, but all of them going back to the old machines that they used to call that they used to use from, from, Debold have this capability in them. It is a feature. It is not a bug. It's programmed into the machines and has been for 10 years or more. Do you think that the um, Trump administration suspected this was going to happen? Well, people and they have known. People, people were, have were known. waiting for it. Go ahead. Yeah, they Do were Do you think ready. they were waiting for it? Probably. Very po probably or possibly. So, the I did a couple of threads actually today, but but one long one that that tries to explain to the best of my ability what I can explain coming out of the mind of an MIT professor, which is limited. But the an MIT professor, another and two other data scientists that are his colleagues that have been working on this for five years or more, identifying when these weighted algorithms are being used to count votes. And they've done a lot of other work with these machines. If anybody knows the forensics of these machines, it's Benny Smith. And he's one of the guys on this three-man team. Benny Smith is a Democrat. What he said, and all you really need to know about what he said about the Michigan data that they looked at in this election. Now remember, the important thing about this is that Michigan swears they have no voter fraud, nothing happened, everything's fine, right? But right. they did they did this analysis that they've been doing on elections for quite a while on Michigan and found an anomaly that indicates that this particular weighted race algorithm was used. Again, what that means is for every two votes, it's giving Trump, well, not every two votes, but if you have one vote for Biden and one for Trump, it's giving Trump 0.6 votes and Biden 1.4. Right? Right. So for every Two votes, one for Biden, one for Trump, gives Trump 0.6, Biden 1.4. You can see how unfair that is, right? Because yeah. Biden is getting yeah. 0. 0.4 of every vote that goes to Trump. Basically, they did four counties, found the anomalies in three, and in the fourth one, it didn't get triggered. I won't go into that. Listen to Cyber Wars on Monday, on Monday night if you want to find out why that was. Or look at my TL, either way. And um, so they found it in three counties in Michigan to the extent of 138,000 votes swapped, right? So our vote gap. So it's... A hundred, what, is it even a hundred thousand votes that Biden is leading by? In, in Pennsylvania? It, no, this is Michigan. 
Uh, I don't even know. Yes. I think it's maybe 15 off, or maybe it's 15 off of um, John James, something like that. It's like... It's it's, it's 58,000, I want to say 58,823, and, and you brought up a really good point. Because right there, that I puts Trump in the lead by 80,000. Remember when I told you, I looked at it when the election first ended, before they added, when, when they stopped counting. Uh-huh. And that's when Trump was ahead. Right. And the difference between the total presidential votes for all of them, including um, Joe Jurgensen and whatnot, and the Senate seats and all of their votes was 58,699. So you tell me what the odds are that the vote count differential between the Senate seat and the presidential is going to consistently stay this entire time within... 200 votes from when it was the, the fourth yeah, you know, or the so day after the election. I think, I think so that if you went and did it right now, pretty much, it's going to be about 58,000 is the differential. Right. This what is, are the odds? So my guess with that is, so just like good security, a good fraud is layered, right? Because if, if, if the authorities find one um, aspect of the fraud that you committed, they didn't find the other two, right? So when you're talking about counting votes, so they find one element of fraud, they throw all those votes out, it's not going to get you to winner, right? So I don't, right. I don't, I think there are, there are layers of th- fraud, and I think that the 90,000 votes that you're talking about are fraudsters being lazy, right? And I don't think there's a lot of those. So, Benny makes the point in the video that the data scientists did that we need to start calling this election fraud because it's more power brokers that um, are actually going to get some power out of it, right? It's, it's It's more of those people than it is, you know, petty fraudsters on the street. Because if you look at the penalties for this kind of fraud, it's just not worth it. What are these people getting out of it? Now... I mean, you know, some people will do stuff like this for $5 a vote and make $50,000 off of it and not think that their defense is going to cost them 150 They don't think about that. But there's not that many of those people. Like our fellow voters aren't doing this on a large scale, right? There's a couple of rings like the one they busted in Texas. Right. There's the, the, but the, po- the power people are stuffing ballot boxes and... You know, they're doing the ballot stuffing, and for the most part, the our, our fellow voters aren't really that much in, involved in this. Somebody's getting something out of it. Somebody that can get something out of it is doing it. You know what I mean? Well, you know, when you, when you think about um, the company up in Canada, I remember that Michelle Obama... They, they hired them to do the whole Obamacare, um, ACE, you know, right. the Health yeah. Act um, yeah. rollout for the, regi- the, you know, what I'm talking about. Yeah, the registration website. Correct. And that thing was so screwed up and messed up. So, obviously, they got connections. They wanted the election so bad that they were doing it in increments where they were thinking no one was going to notice. Well... When you have 72 million people that voted for one candidate, right, more than, you know, any other Republican, I think they've said, um, and, and I know they say supposedly 77 million voted for Biden, but people are going to watch, and they're going to watch extremely carefully, <laughs> because the, we so- all went into this suspecting, and, 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 could, and, and is it because Trump suspected the whole time there was going to be fraud? Oh, I think and he knew. He knew because they knew that these machines could do this. They knew that they yes. were using them in places where they probably would try to do it. I think that they probably knew other things because they own the intelligence agencies, and of course they knew. So, yeah, I mean, I think they had some idea. Uh, I think that the kind of grandiose watermark sting kind of stuff is a little bit yeah. out there. But, see, that everything, just like with Hammer and Scorecard, if you roll it back... To reality from the fringe, the conspiracy theory fringe, you just roll it back to reality, then you get what the truth is, right? So if you take that watermark 
watermark steam theory and you roll it back several levels to reality, that's when you get the Trump administration knew and they were looking and they were ready and they caught it pretty quick and they had a plan for how they were going to set up this apparatus to handle it because these guys put together a hotline and affidavits probably faster than I've ever seen it done. And they're up to like a hundred and something affidavits at this point. I mean, point, so. and, and you think about it because of, you know, basically stating since, you know, what, June or whenever Pelosi started pushing it, actually last year, because um, didn't she start pushing it last year, the mail-in vote, even before COVID even happened? Well, so that's the other that, thing. They've been doing from the... Um, poll- trying to fund it. Right. Well, from yes, exactly. Trying to fund it and trying to make it national so that these, so that the mail-in ballots were at a national level. Well, if you if you use mail-in ballots to increase turnout, that covers up the digital part of what you're doing, or helps right. cover up the digital part of what you're doing. And if you have all those other layers of fraud, you can assume that they're going to catch the poll workers. Um, electioneering and coaching people, which is one of the things that's alleged in the affidavits, you're going to catch them doing that before you catch the um, you catch the algorithm. You know that's the last thing that they caught, thought they were going to catch. So if they caught all these other layers of fraud, they still had the algorithm on their side. They could still win the races because they were going to drive the the gap up so far, the lead up so far that. You couldn't catch them with the other things. They knew that they were being watched and, you know, that that the stuff that they were doing wasn't going to fly. But they have layers of it just in case, right? So you have but all and, these other things going on. But I think they here. didn't count on so many actual Democrats breaking for Trump, which made it a lot harder. Okay, so this the- and that's the important thing about how algorithms work. They calculate in real time if... So if that percentage was 60, uh, you know, 60, 140, and the algorithm is calculating that Trump is still ahead, you can move it to 145, 55. And that's where they got caught because they were flipping numbers so fast and so large in the leads that they were flipping. When they would flip votes, the numbers would be so big that people noticed. The, uh, 145,000 votes. The New York and Times. All for but, Biden and not a single one for Trump. Right. The, the <laughs> New York like Times. And the New York Times puts all the data on their site where people who know Python, Python can scrape it off. And so you have hundreds of people out in the universe on the interwebs looking Watching. at this data and noticing. But the thing that tipped the data scientists off, and then, you know, at this point, we've got data scientists that have been looking at this stuff for five years. And what happened in Atrium County where they had the air quote glitch because computers don't glitch. Software doesn't glitch. There's a bug or it works. One or the other. That's it. This is a feature, not a bug. There wasn't a glitch. But they said we had a glitch, so we hand counted and it flipped the vote back to Trump. These guys went, wait a minute, we want to look at Michigan, and that's where they found, I encourage you guys to look at my tail, it's the tweet is pinned, at cyber wonton, like the Chinese dumpling. Hmm? I'm not Chinese, but I am a dumpling. <laughs> because this, <laughs> Cute. This, this, these guys have been doing this uh, with elections all over the world for over five years. They're, they are, Benny particularly is the preeminent data scientist in the election integrity world. And oh, by the way, he's also an elections uh, commissioner. Is, is this that Benford chart or something like that? What do I keep hearing about no, that? No, this, that, is, that, this that, doesn't have is anything it, to do. Is it the Benford chart? Curve. Is that what it's no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Benford's law, nothing to do okay, with Benford's but the, law. But this that's is also showing anomalies in Biden's every numbers forensic, as well. Every forensic accounting trick or law that I've ever seen applied to election data from 2020 fails. They fail whatever test they. It fails whatever pe- test they put to it. And the tests are it's it's like forensic accounting tests that are used to determine fraud or indicate indicative of fraud and it fails every this data fails every single test so you can eyeball it and look at it some girl 
tweeted a screenshot of raw data in a spreadsheet and said, you can look at this and tell that the votes are flipping, right? So you can look at the raw data and tell. You can run it through Python where by time and watch it jump back and forth. You can see it on video jumping back and forth. You can apply forensic accounting rules to it. It fails. And when you put it up against this data that's specifically meant to measure what these machines are doing, it absolutely shows without any question whatsoever that this algorithm was applied. This specific algorithm was applied to it. When you ask Benny, what are the chances that this is natural? He said 1%. Benny is a Democrat. Benny has no bias in this whatsoever. He said 1% chance that this is natural and not created by a machine. So just like the difference between you when you hand sew something or when you sew something with a sewing machine... You can tell the difference. This is that stark. Wow. And, and, and it's going to come to the point where they're going to have to hand count everything. Because that's the only way. I that's think. Georgia, And Georgia got the jump on it. They said, we're going to do this now. We are hand counting. We are canvassing, re-canvassing every county. And we are um, auditing every county, every single county in the state of Georgia. So now they're going to hand- match the vote to make sure that there's a signature to make sure there's an actual person. Yes, they they match and they match the the votes, but they match signatures. I think they they go back and match to make sure that the mail in ballots have signatures. That um, they they look at the processes, they audit the processes as far as were they matching signatures? Were they you know were they doing everything correctly? And they they're going to re hand count hand count every single ballot. Yes, and if you and, remember, and, and honestly, the, I think every single state that stopped counting all of a sudden, which is unheard of, I've never heard of it. My dad has never heard of it. He's just floored over this. So that the, the algorithm um, the algorithm itself is applied on the machine tabulators, which is a machine that counts the votes on a ballot to hand count them. You factor out the out the possibility of an algorithm altogether. You don't run them back through that machine. So the hand counts will show whether or not that algorithm was applied and flip votes. Because they said, I thought in Georgia they're going to hand count and then they're still going to run them through the machine. Is that wrong? I I don't know if the machine is part of the audit or the um uh the canvassing. They- they but, could feasibly be testing it because if they do the hand count and they actually get the hand count vote and then run them through the machines again, it might show that. Okay, so this 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 algorithm algorithm operates a lot like malware. I mean, I know it's part of the machine, but it operates like mal- malware. They well, they said there was a a switch that you flip. You know, I t- I'd take it that you can do that remotely. I'm assuming um, because they did it on. A bunch of machines, and nobody seems to know that they did it. I mean, so I mean, they just put it back. My point was, was shocked th- that he didn't win New Hampshire, but and he Every lost by a lot more than I thought he was going to lose by too. And it was, I was shocked. That's one thing that I'm saying, and we, I, I guess, we need to get out of here. I think Rick is next, but oh. the, the um, but one thing that I'm going to say is I'm going to I'm assuming that you can do this remotely and. You know, from some remote location, they turn this algorithm on. It's a it's a toggle. It's you flip a switch, and you change from a straight voting system to a weighted algorithm. Um, so I, I'm I'm assuming they can flip that remotely. Every single state that has any machine, not just this machine that is counting by machine at all, every county that counted by machine needs to go back and hand count everything, not just contested states. If it, if it was me and it was my vote, my state is getting recount. But if it was me and it was my vote, I would demand they recount. I'm just saying, doesn't, and it doesn't matter how close it was because we're looking at three counties with 138,000 votes. Potentially, well, I mean, that we, part is We math. went completely red in the, the state 
state all all state offices went completely red, and yet all of our federal the the, the two races, three races, four races, um, were off all the federal ones, the two congressional and the one Senate and the president went, you know, blue. Yeah. And, and I don't I think understand that's, it. So the, 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 it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. All the house seats that flipped doesn't make sense. If I were programming something like this, I wouldn't try to flip the entire ticket. I would flip the, I would flip the president and the Senate. That's what they were trying to flip. Yeah. They thought, you know, they, they were, completely confident that they were going to win all their house races. So they thought, how they were many are, and more. before we let Rick come on, how many are we apart now? Um, I know we just did 11. We, we, we just flipped we another gained 11, right? Yeah, we flipped. And I think there's only seven between the two now, but some of them and they're are still not, they're still not settled. Yeah. I think oh. Fox had five, but I'm not paying attention to what Fox is saying about stuff like this anymore. I believe it or not, Fox is off of my phone. I will not have anything to do with them anymore. I have divorced them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get. I'm not going to go Just that sorry. far. But yeah, let's let's let Rick get in here. Um, you guys know where you can find me because you hear me like two or three times a week. Tell them where they can yeah, find you, guy. You can find me at DMB ten thirty one. Um, also, you can find us on the at the red wine. Thank you guys very much for joining us. And again, we thank Justin. I have put the link on the Red Wine page if anyone's interested in, in the book. It's um, a very good read. It's a short read. Excellent story. Um, and everybody have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Good Jody night. will be back. Good night. <laughs> good night.